Before we begin, some quick mandatory housekeeping. Today's webinar is scheduled to last for about 40 minutes. All the participants are muted, but that shouldn't stop you from voicing out your questions. We have the Q&A tab and also the chat tab to speak with the fellow audience and also raise your questions to the speaker. We'll be sharing the recording in a matter of few minutes right after the webinar. For those of you who are new to Charge Week, Charge Week is a subscription management system that helps staff and other subscription based businesses manage their subscriptions, automate their recurring billing, and provide access to all the relevant metrics that the subscription business would be. Today, we have with us co founder and CEO of one such SaaS company, and also a happy Charge Week customer, Giles from LifeBank, who's going to be sharing his expertise on building a SaaS company that truly believes in the customer first approach. Thanks to him and his team that is making today's webinar and all other charge weeks webinar possible without any kind of operational hassle. Over to you, Jen. Okay, cool. All right, so thank you for having me. Uh, hey guys, I uh, hope the sound is better. I don't know if you can hear me okay. Just leave me a message in chat if the sound is okay on your end. And uh, we'll start. Okay, awesome. Yeah, it's just, I think it's just a connection thing on, um, uh, on the other side of the world <laughs> since we are pretty much. Uh, there are thousands of kilometers apart. Okay, guys, so today we're going to talk about um, customer-centric culture and how we do it uh, at Lifestorm. Uh, so essentially, we're going to talk about quick definition, what is being customer-centric, then how do we use this customer feedback, customer satisfaction, how do we leverage everything in our workflow, how do we use it to handle feature requests, to handle block fixes, and then how do you even react to bad and good feedback. And then we'll do some Q&A, and, um, and yeah. All right, so without, without any more waiting, let's begin. So first of all, quick presentation. My name is Jill. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Lifestorm. I was uh, doing some growth and marketing in a former company called Mention, uh, if you know them. It's a uh, well, social money media monitoring company, if you, you know, look them up. Uh, I'm actually doing a lot of webinars now for the past two years. Uh, you know, obviously since uh, Lifestorm is uh, the tool we are using right now to, to host webinars, and I'm doing a lot of webinars, uh, almost 50 hours in 2018, and uh, yeah, half a million minutes stream on Lifestorm. This is the not my minutes, but across all the customers. So I kind of know my way around webinars and you know and everything marketed related, marketing related. Uh, all right. So next step is what is even you know customer centric? Um, oh, one thing I didn't mention, guys, but you know feel free to drop your questions in the questions tab. I'll we'll make sure to answer everything at the end of the webinar, and maybe we'll do some back and forth during the presentation. So what is being customer centric? In my opinion, it is a two way relationship. So it means that basically, you as a company, your goal is obviously to create a great product and increase customer satisfaction. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and I mean it's the way relationship because you grow with them as a company, right? They give you feedback, positive and negative, and then you uh, take advantage of those of that feedback to build the product, build the team, build uh, you know, build the business. And in their end, they get they grow as well because you give them a relevant product and you give them great support. For example, um, hi, Dylan. Thank you for coming. Um, so another aspect of the definition is how do you even measure that, uh, you know, that customer centricity, right? And let's say, how do you even, yeah, how do you measure yourself as a customer centric company, right? And there are a lot of KPIs you can use. There is NPS, there is even word of mouth, which is kind of qualitative data and not really uh, quantitative. Uh, public ratings, separate ratings, there are a lot of things actually. Um, if you go to the poll section, I'm just going to go ahead and publish a poll and let me know on the poll section what are the metrics you guys track and, or if you don't track, there is also an option. So let me know in the poll section, you just got a notification. All right. And the third question you have to ask yourself about customer centricity is who in a company is responsible for it? Who is going to own that part? And how we do it, I mean, this is actually my opinion and this is how we do it here. There is this, right, there is top management, so founders, CEO, C-levels are going to basically define what are the main 
the main outlines of what is being customer centric, how do we take care of customers, how do we treat them. Um, those are the main guidelines that we provide. And then basically customer success will own the uh, relation between product and customer, so the proxy between customer and product. Then the sales team will have their part to play as well, but this, way, this time is just the relationship between product and leads, right? And how do we leverage feedback, not necessarily for customer, but from leads who are essentially future customers. And then your marketing will make sense of everything and create like a customer profile and then leverage that profile to enrich the experience of the sales team, the customer success, make them more relevant. And finally, the product will own that relevance and make sure that the app matches the customer's expectations. So as you can see, it's a quite of a transversal thing, right? Being customer centric is not only support, it's not just customer success, it's everyone is concerned about that. Everyone is involved in that process of being customer centric. Um, all right, let me see the polls here. Oh, interesting. So there are actually a lot of you monitoring comments, so chat tickets, right, and reviews. And as a matter of fact, I think all those KPIs are super valid, right? And um, we measure those as well you know, at Lifestorm. So let's focus on the CS and the sales, so the business part, the customer facing part. Uh, CS and sales will be client face, will be client client facing, and they will be, you know, uh, their job will be to compile, categorize, and activate those customer feedback and follow up to the leads to the customers. It's really customer facing. Marketing will make sense of everything, uh, leverage the best customers, leverage the best profile, and then um, create actionable levers, create great channels that are really relevant to the customers and the leads. And for the best customers, make sure they turn into loyal customers, become advocates, and then create like this, you know, um, kind of a viral loop, right? And, you know, good customers talk about you, then you create leads and you create customers, and then there is this circle of uh, thinking, I don't know how you say that in English actually, but uh, yeah, circle of virtue, I don't know. <laughs> Um, finally, product, including the techs, including developers, their job is to stay relevant to the customer's expectation and obviously to stay as agile as possible to make sure to release bug fixes and features when the customer needed needed the most to you know just delight the customers and make sure that you know they are super uh, happy with your service, right? All right. Hey. Quick question before we uh, move on to the next bit, right? So you yep. mentioned about uh, marketing team uh, able to make sense of the data that's coming from uh, CS and sales. Yeah. Uh, so as a marketer, uh, I'm quite intrigued about how do you typically do it. So can you can you uh, help me understand with a bit of example on how you do it at Platform? Great, good question. Uh, so typically, we so there's two things. So the first one is so you have your customer and there is a lot of data that you produce on those customers. There is the uh, I would say firmographic data that you produce in a customer. So the business data of the uh, industry X, Y, Z, which sector, which size have they raised funds? Have, do they have uh, the number of employees, the tags, the technology they are using? So that data will give you a profile of the company. And then you can break down the revenue. You can break down the number of signups using those that data that would give you for example different buckets so you can say for example i want to grab the revenue and for the top tier you know the one that produces the most revenue i'm going to see uh the firmographics of that segment of that bucket and say okay there is a pattern i need to identify and for example maybe i get the most revenue from universities from education organization, right, with a certain size. So that's for the firmographic part. Then you have the event part. So maybe there is a pattern across customers that have done X, Y, Z events, meaning they have used that feature, they have received that specific email, they have talked to that person. And so that's for the more behavioral data. And finally, there is the, um, I'd say, so, uh, 
Yo, that's actually pretty much it. There's, yeah, the behavioral and thermographic data that will basically de design some kind of pattern that can reuse them to make things more relevant. And you can do the same then for the leads. So the leads, you have the thermographic behavioral in terms of closing, how much those guys close versus those guys. And then you draw the, the, the patterns. And this is how we do it, for example, to make it really actionable. How we measure those thermographic, we use APIs such as, for example, Clurbit, mm -hmm. that basically enrich, so clurbit.com, you can check them out. Uh, you use, uh, you send them an email and then they give you uh, actionable data, more uh, data on that specific email. So, you know, customer uh, industry size, you know, that kind of stuff. Alexa rank, you know, that kind of data. Uh, for the events, it's just a tracking thing. So you have to make sure you have a good tracking plan. Uh, you analyze all the main steps of your funnel. And as for the sales process, it's Clearbit plus, I'd say, the qualification, discovery qualification checkboxes that your sales team have. And so are they, for example, let's take the example of Chargebee. Are they, are they a subscription business? Yes, no. Are they using another tool as a subscription metric, uh, no, subscription payment processor? Yes, no. Um, the size, that kind of stuff, right? And then you have this pattern, declarative data of pat, uh, pattern, and then you have the filmographic pattern you can also reuse. And the job of the marketing is to compile all that data and then produce content to enrich the job of the TS and job of the salesperson and also to create an, an up-to-date profile, uh, I'd say customer profile, ideal customer profile, then you can reuse for, you know, uh, uh, retargeting ads or prospection or whatever. Great, great. Interesting. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay, let me see here. Okay. Guys, don't forget to leave your questions if you have any, right? All right. Um, next up is, you know, basically the whole scheme or have, how everything is working, right? So there is this feedback coming from either customer or leads. Then there's the sales team, the CS team that, you know, ingest that feedback. And then marketing produces either channels for the sales team or content or whatever. And same thing on the CS team, they produce content that is relevant for that team. And for the product is a more, uh, even a more macro approach, they ship feature that you know will accelerate sales closing because there are super high value features that are really demanded, really relevant to those leads and customers. And they bug fix, they improve the product on demand in a super agile way to make sure the customers are always happy with the thing that we produce. So this is the main pattern that we try to respect uh, as much as we can here at Lifestorm. And uh, so far, it's, it's pretty good. So far, we are getting some good results, so happy with that. Um, so that's for the theory, right? Um, maybe we could just, yeah, one thing, yeah, there's another part here. Uh, why is this so important for us? I mean, I'd say all that, i say, yeah, that's a theory. This is how we do it. Now, why, sh why do we do that? Why do we bother doing this? Um, the first step, the first thing is that we have a landscape that is super competitive. If you go on the web conferencing market, there are a lot of players in the webinar space, in the meeting space, big players. And I'm sure in the payment processor market is the same thing. There are a lot of people, some big players. How do you differentiate? You know, how do you stand out from those, uh, on those market? And I think being customer centric improves a lot of different stuff. Customer satisfaction is super useful to increase word of mouth and then acquisition. It increases also the visibility because a product that has a business that is super customer centric has this almost like a feature of being good at support, being good at shipping well, shipping good features, shipping bug fixes, that makes sense. So it's almost like a competitive advantage. So yeah. Product market means being customer centric. You have to do it. Second thing is, yeah, as I was saying, good, good customer satisfaction means good word of mouth means more acquisition means more revenue eventually. So super logical, you know, uh, equation. And the good thing also from a product perspective is if you track everything well, you will see spikes 
you know, of either good feedback or bad feedback. And when you have, you know, spikes of bad feedback, that gives you probably the pulse on your product. Are people getting frustrated because of the roadmap is not, you know, fast enough? Or are people frustrated because there are a lot of bugs lately? And if you track all that, you will see that you have a pulse, really, of your product. Yeah, so that was the final theory thing. Um, so let's go with the, something more actionable that we use uh, internally here at Livestorm. All right. Um, OK, I'm just going to see here more questions. No, we're good. OK, awesome. Let's continue. So that's for the NPS feedback. So uh, before we start even explaining this, the NPS feedback is basically a notes a grade for 0 to 10. And there are three uh, personas. There are uh, detractors, so people that grade you from 0 to 6, then neutral from 7 to 8, and then promoters from a, uh, from 9 to 10 included. So uh, on a monthly basis, we send out an NPS survey to our customers, and it's an in-app tool that we use. It's called Satismeter, uh, satismeter.com. Check them out. Pretty cool team and software. And um, you can send a grade, and you can send a comment. And the comment is super important because it gives you more insights on why people give you that grade. So one thing that we check is, does the grade has comment? And if so, we send them an automated email based on the grade. Say, OK, thank you for this line. Um, I saw you mentioned you know, it has such thing. Uh, how can we, is there a way, ideally, how would you like to improve this? You know, and on the contrary, when there is a bad grade, and you say, hey, why did you give us that comment? Uh, if there is no comment, then we push the data to Zipper and then we add a note using, um, uh, we actually, it's jelly we're on. So the, when there is a comment, we add a note to the roadmap product we are using, the roadmap software, and uh, we attach that to the, um, to the customer. So we know on the roadmap that customer A send us an NPS of you know, eight with a feature request. And that is on the product roadmap. There we have his email. And we know how to recontact when that feature is released. And then we open an intercom conversation to reply and you know, say, OK, thank you for the feedback. We have added your voted roadmap, blah, blah, blah. So that's, we try to automate everything between the NPS tool, the uh, automated email software that we use. It's called customer.io. And the product roadmap tool that we use as well, which is called product bold. Then everything is hooked with Zapier and Segment. OK. Um, how do we handle feature requests? Uh, we have a lot of feature requests, and you guys probably have a lot as well. And the main difficulty here is to stay as relevant as possible to make sure we ship the right thing at the right time, make sure that we take into account every little input that we get. So for that, again, we are using uh, Product Board, productboard.com, which gives us a... Um, all the tools to create the feature, to organize them by, you know, uh, hierarchy, to make sure we priorities and, you know, relate to the company size and everything. So when we get this conversation on Intercom with people asking us for a feature, we don't have that feature, so we add a tag to the conversation. It's the PB tag. Automatically, the conversation is sent to the product board software, so the roadmap software. And then when the feature is released, then we open up back the same conversation or we just reach out to the customer and uh, we tell them, hey, feature has been released. You asked for this on, you know, a few months ago. Here it is. What do you think? And the same thing happens for the customer. We use Pipedrive as a CRM software. And uh, when we have a feature request from a lead, then we do the same thing. We create the note. And then if the, if the lead is a customer, then good enough. We're just going to, uh, to let them know that the feature is out. If the lead is not a customer yet, then it's a good 
way to reactivate that lead and see if they want to go for a subscription. All right, let me see here. Um, bug fixing, so again, same process. Uh, Inacom has a great integration with GitHub. It's a native integration, it's super nice. GitHub is the solution we use to create tickets, um, engineering tickets, and uh, close all the bug fix, all the improvements that we can have on, uh, on Nextom. So uh, intercom conversation, we have a bug, we have an improvement. We basically grab the link from the um, intercom conversation. We attach that to the issue, to the ticket on GitHub. And once an engineer has closed the ticket, once the issue has been resolved, then it opens the intercom conversations again and we can you know, reach out to that person, hey, your problem has been solved. Uh, try it out, let me know if we could do more to help you. And that creates a good relationship because you know, it's personal. People are delighted to see that we have taken into account their input and they, it's, it's a, you know, and again, they'll, they'll probably reach out more with more ideas, with more bug fix, with more improvements, and then it's just you know, a virtual circle. Um, so that's actually also a good one. Um, as I was saying, we we have a lot of a lot of competitors, right? We have a lot of people playing on the space, and one thing we have found to uh, to stand out is to get good reviews. Is to make sure we are present in the comparison platforms such as G2 Crowd, Captera, all those guys, right? And uh, I mean, it's important to appear there because when people are benchmarking the solutions, they are using those platforms. So it was important for us to be there. Um, so how do we do this? How do we industrialize? How do we generate reviews? How do we generate notoriety in a word of mouth uh, in a kind of automated way? So we track everything, events, uh, identities, attributes, what people are doing, who they are. And after some time, when we detect there are customers that are using Lifestorm actively, we ask them, hey, if you want, you can get a coupon, you can get a discount if you spend a little time with, uh, to help us and write an honest review on those platforms. Uh, that will help us, and I know it's, it will take like maybe 10 minutes of your time, I would be happy to reward with a, a coupon or Amazon gift card or whatever. And if they... Uh, send us a review and then uh, you know they are still active after a few times a few months and uh, NPS score is still okay still they are still promoters of the product then you know what maybe you could do another step take another step and maybe you can ask them hey would you like to appear on the website you're one of the most active customers and you're super happy with the product we'll love to highlight your logo, your company, and maybe you wrote a story about your use case because we find it super interesting. And uh, you know, that, that's a way for you to you know, even just get, get a backlink or just to appear somewhere else. And for us, it's always nice to showcase what uh, our customers are doing. So that's actually a good way of building notoriety. Um, and that's, I think, one of the most uh, interesting uh, one of the most interesting uh, workflow that we have. So churn is something that happens, you know, when you have a, a SaaS or software, people just cancel their accounts at some point for, you know, any reasons. So the idea was how do we track those reasons, right? How do we make sure that we get the appropriate response based on that churn reason? So. When people churn, and we track, again, that using segment, using all the tools uh, I've mentioned. So we track the churn, we track the churn reason. If they give us a reason, it could be missing features, maybe technical, uh, technical you know, bug, something like that. It could be a budget thing. It could be, I'm just going to post my account and come back later. It could be a lot of things. So we list all the reason. They ask send us the reason. Then once the reason is sent, we send that to Zapier. Um, Zapier catches the reason, then it adds the reason to the charge B customer, and then we can basically break down all the revenue, all the churn, all the you know LTV metrics based on those um, based on those uh, on, on those reasons, um, and 
typically you could you know have some insights such as you know maybe the churn is not that high if you exclude uh, people that have sent you uh, I'm just going to post my account you'll see that the churn from people that have like real churn that have uh, people that have you know budget or missing budget or missing features or technical difficulties you'll see that the churn is actually much lower than you think so it's a really good way of breaking down metrics in general to pass those shared reasons. And um, another thing is, uh, if they don't give us the reason, then we just send them an automated email saying, hey, you gave you churn, didn't say why, um, can you just elaborate a bit more on that? Um, just to make sure you know we, we, we have all the details that will help us improve the product, blah, blah, blah. And it will just open so if we don't get any response, then we just open a intercom conversation. We'll be more proactive in how we reach out. And then it's sent back to Zapier, et cetera. All right. OK, I see questions here. So I'm just going to take those uh, after, the, after the talk. But I think we are, yeah, I think that's, we're done. We can move to the Q&A if you want. Thanks, guys. Uh, before we uh, move on to the question, I would like to uh, do a quick poll uh, to understand what other SaaS topics that would uh, interest the audience. So this will uh, help us curate more of these webinars. Uh, oh yeah. Um, move to the poll section. Uh, so I just publish this. Yep. Oh, you actually a good topic here. How do we use churn, sales, go to market for new market? Oh, a lot of good topics here. <laughs> Awesome. Revenue operations is pretty interesting as well. I guess uh, it's a good opportunity to go talk about uh, revenue story. Actually, we use revenue story in ChargeB to you know, measure the breakdown uh, per, uh, you know, using the custom fields with the churn reason, et cetera. So yeah, it's a pretty awesome tool. Uh, yeah, thanks for that, Giles. Uh, so I have a question before we uh, take the audience question. So uh, you mentioned about uh, identifying the churn reasons, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious uh, with respect to uh, what's a success with respect to the project? How genuine and actionable are these reasons that uh, when, you, when you reach out to your churn customer and ask for a particular reason? Uh, can you, can you uh, explain with an example on uh, how, what, what exactly was the reason they mentioned and how did you take it back into the product and uh, yeah, complete the... That's, that's a good question. So. Uh, obviously, there are a few things. So if it's kind of a different, yeah, it depends on the reason. So let's say, for example, someone has said, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and pose my account. So let's take the lifestyle example. I'm going to pose my account because, uh, you know, I don't, have, uh, I don't have the resources, I don't have the people to do webinars during, you know, the first, you know, in the, in the next two months. So one thing that we have done is actually to solve that problem by, uh, providing on-demand webinar, which is basically webinars that you can turn into evergreen webinars. You can just, you know, let people register to a past webinar, you know, it was, that was, you know, six months ago. So it was a good way for us to maintain subscriptions, uh, mm -hmm. even if they didn't need to host live webinars. So that was one main thing. We have also shipped a meeting product called Lifestyle Meet, uh, which is complementary to the webinar. And if you don't enable do webinar for the next two months, that's okay. You can still do some meetings using Lifestyle Meet. So this is how we drive, this is how we, for example, react on the pose. So, and that's a really product response. And let's say, for example, we have the churn reason budget, right? So people, no, they don't want to use the live sound anymore because they don't have the budget anymore. So this is a simple fix. You just send them an automated email saying, I understand you're a small company, blah, blah, blah. Here's, maybe here's a coupon. Or maybe here's a yearly subscription with a slight, with a, like a significant discount. And then, you know, let me know how that works. You have one invoice with a discount. Maybe you can keep your uh, subscription for a whole new year. And this way you avoid, uh, I avoid the churn and you have something, you know, that is much cheaper than you, than you had. So okay. each reason has a response, but it's not necessarily a product response. It could be a marketing response or a sales response. Right, right. 
Wonderful. Uh, we have a question from Dalin who's asking, uh, when requesting uh, feedback from customer, uh, do you showcase all customers willing to appear on the website or do you build a repository of clients that you can use later on? Great question, indeed. Um, when you have a lot of customers, we have we start to have like a lot of customers and a lot of people that you know we send an email say, do you want to appear on the website? Uh, one thing that we do is that we don't send automatically that email. We have uh, we use customer.io and customer.io um, has this feature which is pretty cool when you can first send a Slack message saying, hey, I have scheduled an email for customer X or customer YZ, blah, 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 and for them to appear on a website. It's in draft mode. Do you want to send that email? And, um, and then we just validate the draft according to the, again, according to the ideal customer profile. Obviously, we showcase the customers on a website that, are match, that matches our ideal customer profile. Otherwise, it will be too, too much noise, too much confusion, I guess. Right, right. All right. Uh, so uh, one more question uh, with respect to handling feature requests, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, one common thing with most SaaS companies is uh, the user base is kind of diverse. So not, not all users would use the product the same way. The use cases might vary. So uh, how do you handle requests from users who are not your primary user persona? It's very difficult to say no, but how do you, uh, what, how do you handle it tactically? Um, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Actually, we, we have a ponderation. Uh, there are a few ponderation columns in product balls. So uh, you can have, you can say stuff, this is really important for them. This is the, um, the type of company. And this is, uh, you know, other, all of criteria. And in the end, you have a score for that feature or for that feedback that, you know, kind of makes sense if eventually in the end. And, um, but I think, yeah, you have to make sure that obviously the most feature that, you, again, you don't ship automatically the features that are the most requested. Even though there are a couple that's more requested, you have to make sure that when you launch the project that this fits your ICP expectations. So there is, so far we don't have any, I'd say more precise and automated way to make sure we don't send that, we don't uh, build the feature for, for you know, just for for everyone, and yeah, we try to have some kind of a meeting to make sure that the features we ship matches the ICP expectation, the ideal customer expectation. This is a hard. Uh, this is a hard, uh, hard question, actually. Um, mm -hmm. uh, how do you guys do, actually, Charlie? Do you have some kind of process in place uh, with respect to the, the the same question? How do you handle customers? Customer requests from you know those who doesn't who don't really match the do you take them into account and note them somewhere or do you say yes or you say no we don't even care uh, how does that work? Yeah, uh, actually, the question surfaced because uh, this is something that uh, we have been seeing a lot. Uh, the charge me being uh, uh, it's, it's a product that a different type of subscription business use, right? So it's mm -hmm. not just us, but uh, we have requests coming from subscription commerce businesses which have a a completely different uh, way of working. So actually, it's a question more from a personal learning point of view. Right. right. Okay. So I think, I mean, if, if I had to think about, I think that uh, it's a ponderation thing. You, you have to have some kind of equation that says, okay, this is an interesting feedback, but does that person fit my ICP? No, then I'll get like minus 10 or something to the final score. And then in the end, when you sum up everything in your roadmap, that feature should be lower than the others. So right. I think product, product boy enables you to add some more criteria. So I think that would be a good, um, yeah, a good idea right. to, to try that. Uh, Dalin has one more question. Uh, what methods have you used to identify your ideal customer profile? Um, so actually it was kind of a, uh, kind of a, uh, I would say natural thing, but <laughs> so uh, from the start at Lifestorm, we have used uh, Clearbit to measure all the signups, all the yeah, all the signups coming through Lifestorm. And from the very beginning, we had an hypothesis that software companies, for example, were willing to you know host webinars or meetings to train at, at scale their their customer or to host demos at scale. 
So uh, we put Clubit, we tracked that, and uh, for every single sign up, for every single customer, and we had a dashboard of the customer called Customer Insights, and we could break down all the customers, all the signups based on industry, size, job role, etc. And after some time, that hypothesis was validated. We knew that the best customers, the main customers using the platform, the main users of the platform were industry SaaS, they were SaaS companies from, let's say, uh, um, you know, 11 to 50 employees, and the main job role was either a CMO or you know, marketing manager. So that was a good start for us, and then with time, we have you know, enriched that data with uh, events, behavioral data, so for example, if they have used webinars in the past, etc. Sure, right. Uh, we have one more interesting question uh, here from uh, Jack, uh, who's a fellow Chargebee user. I assume. So he's asking, Chargebee has a newest feature for crossing subscriptions. Uh, do you use this, and uh, how does it impact your metrics, and when do you when do you prefer to use it, or when do you recommend people to use this? That's a, a good question. Actually, we saw that feature. We haven't implemented. Actually, we are refactoring our billing, and we are thinking of you know maybe doing something using that feature, subscription pausing. So I could. I couldn't give you any metrics if we're not using it, but I think uh, I think the point of posing the subscription must must take two things into account. First, the churn reason: are they leaving because they are, don't have the resources, or because if it's not a product thing, maybe you should suggest posing, right? Um, and there is another thing: is the type of company, right? It, usually, if this is like a smaller company, you can just ask them to pose. Um, that's another thing. And uh, the way you pose it, it could be something like, uh, I haven't looked at uh, the subscription posing in details, but I think one thing you could do is, maybe I'm not going to charge you with, I don't know, 100 bucks per month, but maybe we could just keep paying just to maintain your data at, let's say, 29 per month, you know, if that's doable. Um, so that's another, that's the first option. And another option is actually quite inspired from the um, the box subscription businesses. So you know, when you receive box at your house, you know, with uh, you know, uh, I don't know, cosmetic products, for example. So there is a second option, and those guys are doing. Uh, for example, you can pause your subscription for one, two, three months, and then it automatically it is renewed. But it's not. A, it's not a cancellation. You know that the status is opposed, and you know that the reactiv reactivation will be then uh, automatic. Do it will be done automatically. So right. this is another thing you can take into account in your uh, in your uh, churn and revenue metrics. So those are two yeah. valid options. Uh, I think at, I would prefer the first one because you maintain some kind of revenue and uh, it's more of a downgrade rather than a churn. So yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, adding to uh, what you said, uh, I think uh, this is this, this is a, a excellent feature in terms of uh, battling churn. Uh, once you identify if someone is uh, churning away or even downgrading, uh, I think this 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 is something that you can proactively suggest to your customer. Yeah. And also uh, for products that are seasonal, uh, mostly mostly uh, in the subscription commerce space, uh, maybe the products are mostly during the holiday season and not not beyond that. You can have post subscriptions. And even from a uh, from a marketing standpoint, uh, uh, let's say for a webinar software, if you think you're not going to run webinars for the next month, uh, maybe due to the holiday season, of that could be a reason why you wouldn't uh, plan your marketing activities towards the end of the December. Uh, you could you could ask for a, a subscription pause for that particular month. So if you have a seasonal product, I think that's uh, that's something you should consider. Yeah. Okay. I, okay. Think, uh, I think. Uh, let's see for the question here. I think we're good. Oh, uh, that was the last slide. Sorry, I was just checking. Okay, cool. All right. And, uh, all right. All right. So people seem to be uh, really expecting the sales marketing alignment plus how to reduce churn. I mean, yeah, that's uh, those are big topics. Cool. All right. Uh, so I think I think we can. Uh, for this session. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. Question. <laughs> yeah. Is it, is it standard practice to remove user data after cancellation? Uh, 
Well, you know, that's uh, actually, uh, well, there are two things. In France, for example, you have to keep uh, some financial data. That's the law for sometimes you have to keep financial data. Um, I don't know how, how that works in different countries. Uh, as for removing user data itself, um, it depends. You know, if, if you're under GDPR, you have to delete the data if they ask you. Or oh, there is another option, which I think is a good good option as well, is to instead of removing user data, and if you want to keep the metrics, I'd say the global metrics, you could just anonymize the user data. But in both cases, I don't think that keeping the user data as is 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 so much of a good practice. I mean, after some time, at least maybe after like a few months, you should maybe remove that, or if they proactively ask you, you should maybe remove or delete it. But uh, I think I, I've seen a, a SaaS company doing anonymization uh, instead of deleting, which I think is a, is a good alternative, to my opinion. Yep, uh, I think uh, with that, we can close today's webinar. Yep, yeah. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> Uh, thank you once again for the uh, session, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining this uh, webinar. Uh, if you if you want to listen to more of this, please head to charlesb.com slash webinars and register for our upcoming sessions. And also, yeah. uh, if you uh, you have a success formula that you have cracked at your company, uh, feel free to reach out to me at shrimitnatsharvi.com. Uh, I'm just dropping you the email in the chat. So yeah, I look okay. out for you. And thanks everyone for joining today. Have a good day. Thanks. Have a good day.